is Jim Olivato. He has an undergraduate degree from the University of Illinois Chicago and went on to become certified and licensed as an athletic trainer in 1991. Prior to coming to ATI Worksite Solutions Incorporated, Jim has a principal, Jim was a principal in Corporate Health Solutions Inc, where he specialized in healthcare cost analysis and on-site medical management solutions for organizations in both public and private sectors. Jim created CNA Financial's postural training program and on-site rehab center and was the former head athletic trainer for the Chicago Wolves professional hockey team. He was an adjunct faculty member in the athletic training program at St. Louis University in Romeoville, Illinois from 2002 to 2018. Jim has been a speaker at many conferences over the years, including OSHA, VPPPA Region 5, the National Safety Council, American Society of Safety Professionals, Wisconsin Safety Council, Great Lakes Athletic Trainers Association, and the National Athletic Trainers Association. ATI Worksite Solutions welcomed Jim to the team in 2012, where he serves as Industry Director of Operations. So let's welcome Jim. James. James. Thank you. Well, great to be here. Thanks for the intro. Appreciate it. Um, you guys probably heard um, it's kind of a nice um, segue from Miranda's talk, which was excellent. Um, a little bit of taste of, of athletic trainers working in industry. We, we don't do anything as extensive in terms of studies, but definitely wanted to uh, share with all of you some of the things um, you know, that have sort of developed over the years uh, with our profession working in industry. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, as you heard, I'm a Midwest person. I'm from Chicago originally. Uh, this past August, I just moved to Dallas, Texas, so getting further out to your area. Loving it. Um, definitely loving the weather over the winter. And so first time here at Rocky Mountain, so I'm excited to uh, hopefully continue to attend, uh, maybe even next year in, in Denver. But um, yeah, I wanted to uh, share some of the things that uh, we're seeing out there. And opportunity, really. It's right. It's about opportunity uh, for athletic trainers, I think. Um, you know, from the times that I had spent early on in uh, NATA committees, um, back when we called it the Clinical Industrial Corporate Committee, we were talking about all these opportunities. Um, it's great to see the growth and the number of uh, people, uh, athletic trainers, that are in this part uh, of our, um, I guess, our practice. So very, very exciting to, uh, to share some of this uh, with you. Said point it this way. There we go. <laughs> Didn't hit it hard enough. So just a little bit about ATI. So an organization that I've been with for uh, almost 20 years. Uh, we are a physical therapy company, but we have a division that works uh, solely with employers um, doing injury prevention um, and quite a few other things. And I want to share some of that with you. But we work with over 100 employers across the country, and um, you know it's really about providing uh, musculoskeletal health. So just wanted to share a little bit about my background and the company as well before we get going here. So, um, you know, this is something that actually is a slide that I've used for many, many years. And in, in some respects, there has been some changes, but in others, there hasn't. So, you know, we've seen, um, I started and did most of my time in a clinic, in a PT clinic. And we, I think we've seen over the years, um, unfortunately us getting really pushed out of that piece uh, of what we can do for for uh, for the general population and I think that was one of the things that I started one of the reasons I started to look at this part of our practice in industry was because we were really getting pushed to the side in the clinic so uh, I think unfortunately that has kind of remained the same um, you know with a lot of companies even our, our own where it's kind of been back to either sports medicine or this industrial path um, you know, there's still, as we've struggled, I was on Capitol Hill many times. Uh, I was part of the Governmental Affairs Committee with the NATA, And, uh, you know, those um, battles that continue to go on for us to be recognized by Medicare, um, it, that, that was painful. It's still painful to see that, you know, we aren't recognized. But again, this is an arena that we are being recognized and recognized in a different way and being paid for our services in a much different way and probably a better way, quite frankly. So we'll talk a little bit about that. 
Um, I don't need to tell anybody about the government. Uh, again, I haven't changed a slide in many years, and I don't think it's, it's probably um, any different now than it is. It's probably worse. Um, so government entities that run universities that you all work with and, and schools, high schools, you know, less and less money there. So another reason, again, to look at this as an opportunity, hopefully, uh, for, for some. And, you know, we've also struggled with just state regulations. I just found out <coughs> the state that I came from, Illinois, just uh, passed an update, uh, which is another area that I worked on for many years in the 90s, which we never got any traction with. They finally, after probably almost 40 years since they've had a Practice Act change there, and to get it more uh, aligned to what we do and the different uh, people that we serve. So, a lot of that is still a challenge for us. So I think that's, again, one of the great things about um, athletic trainers and in industry. <clears throat> so I think, you know, the other thing that we all have going for us, and I think, you know, probably my passion for what we do in industry is that we have touched so many lives in the general population. You all do a great job you know, working in traditional settings, taking care of high school athletes, collegiate athletes, professional athletes, whatever it might be. But um, I can tell you that um, when I see our folks that are out on the field, the difference that they make in people's lives is really um, powerful. And uh, it's kind of my passion behind what we do um, as athletic trainers in the industry. And I don't do that work. I have, we have a team out there, but um, it's definitely really rewarding. And I think, again, it's something that, as an athletic trainer, um, we are absolutely uh, best in class to take care of the general population when it comes to musculoskeletal health. And I think um, more and more athletic trainers are realizing that, they're coming into that uh, part of our profession, and they're showing it. And, and I'm gonna kind of give you some, um, some ways that we show that, uh, that value. You know, one of the things that, you know, we've always been a part of um, is prevention, right? So from pre-injury to post. But I will tell you that in the industrial setting, our focus is very much on prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. And I think if you disagree with me, I understand that, but I really believe that the traditional sports medicine, what we do as athletic trainers, you know, for athletics is, is very reactive if you think about it. I mean, we're triaging, we're, our goal is to try to keep people out there in some respects. And we, while we do do a lot of preventative programming, we don't, I don't think we do as much as we do in the industrial setting. I'm gonna kind of explain that to you. Not a knock against it, certainly just the, the I think the way it is, but um, so that is a nuance and a difference uh, if you go from working in a traditional setting to um, the industrial setting is, is really a big focus on prevention and biomechanics and ergonomics. So again, if it's something that, you know, an opportunity that you're looking for, it's, it's I don't even, I don't know if this is appropriate, it's not even outside the box anymore, right? We have a, a, a decent amount of our profession, it's still very low. It's one of the other reasons I wanna come here and share it with you, because we still don't see it that much in conferences, uh, both nationally and regionally. Um, but we used to say it's time to think outside the box. Not so much anymore, employers know about who we are and what we can do, but if it is something that you want to do, whether it's individually or with an organization like ours, the employer is, is the target. And we're going to kind of talk about how we um, how we sort of uh, work with the employers to show value of what we do. You know, really everything, as I mentioned, what we do is all about prevention, and I think um, there's terms out there that we use like early intervention, injury prevention. Um, root cause mitigation, but all of those things in, in combination, the idea is to reduce injuries, right? That's what we as athletic trainers do. And probably the most important thing that we've brought to the industrial setting is the ability to see uh, an, an employee that has an issue with their shoulder and more immediately assess it and understand what's needed to go forward, but more importantly, why are they having that shoulder pain or shoulder discomfort? And that is the key, because if you have, like we work with many organizations that work with repetitive, you know, in factories, production uh, facilities, 
If one of them has it, probably five others have it. Um, so if we're able to identify what the triggers are, what the hammers are, and eliminate that, um, boy, that makes a big difference when it comes to not only an employee's life, them having pain or getting injured, but also that employer and how they do business, right? And production, are they, meet, are they able to meet production when they have a bunch of employees that are hurting? Probably not. And then of course that goes to the bottom line. So a, a lot of what we do is really um, identifying what the, what the root cause of some of the challenges that employees may have in terms of pain, discomfort, or injury. I think this is probably, I think you all know this because you know, we see it on a daily basis even in a traditional setting that you know, three quarters of the injuries that we see could have been prevented, right? If we would have done this or if we would have, you know, let's just take an overhead athlete. Um, you know, if we would have addressed rotator cuff strength, sta scapular stability, posture, biomechanics, you know, right? But we don't often get the opportunity to do that with our overhead athletes, right? Um, and this is, is a little different in the, in the um, in industrial setting. We do get a little bit more opportunity, and I'll show you how we do that, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's not a scientific number, it's, it's kind of anecdotal, but um, what we have seen over time is that it, it's pretty close to that in terms of you know, what types of things we see on site and are we able to resolve them without the need for an employee to go to outside medical care. That's kind of a term that we use a lot. So we call our folks, our athletic trainers that work out in the field in all kinds of different industries, we call them early intervention specialists. You can call them whatever you want, you can call them an industrial athletic trainer, um, but it's really about being a little bit of a hybrid professional. So our, we're utilizing all of our skills uh, as an athletic trainer, all of our background, but we're using it in a slightly different way. And there's a lot of different functions that we serve. The main function, as I mentioned, was, was actually identifying and preventing um, injuries from occurring. And a lot of that is done by having a presence on the manufacturing floor. So as an example, if we work with an organization that's, you know, they're making, uh, I'll just say, uh, cheese. We have, a, we have a big employer here uh, that's actually in New Mexico that um, we have um, uh, a contract with. Well, they're doing, uh, you know, things throughout the day in a production facility that may be repetitive, may be heavy, whatever it might be, but what our person is doing is actually being out on the manufacturing floor. So they're all garbed up in the, you know, things that you need for food safety. They have a smock on, they have a hairnet, those kind of things not the glamorous part of industrial athletic training. We've got to fit in and we'll talk a little bit about that, but they're actually out there interacting with the employees and number one, learning what it is that they do, what they have to do. And then obviously putting our eyes on it from an anatomical, biomechanical, ergonomical standpoint so that we can see, you know, if somebody is doing this all day, you know, what might happen to them? We know, right, as athletic trainers, something's gonna go down in the shoulder, right? If we don't get them, their elbows in. So it's really about learning their jobs, learning the rigors, and trying to identify things that can make their job easier and much more safe from a musculoskeletal standpoint. And certainly when somebody does have an issue, then we're gonna able to give them some self-care things that they can do on their own to hopefully mitigate it. If we catch it early, right, it's not rocket science, we're gonna probably be able to mitigate it. So that's kind of a neat thing about what we do as athletic trainers. Um, there's many other things, functions, and I'll go through some. I'm not gonna, I have a lot of slides in here. I probably won't get through all of it in detail, but I just wanted to share with you some of the other things that we're, we're doing as athletic trainers in industry. Things like a functional task analysis, that, that we call it that, or a functional job description. In other words, what does the employee do? What are the weights and measures and forces that they have to do on a daily basis um, so that the employer can understand that? If they get injured, a physician can understand what the requirement is for them to go back. Um, it also helps us, allows us to develop something called a post-offer test. So a lot of employers want to know if they have, you know, physically demanding jobs. Can this employee actually physically do it? Are they physically able to do that? And we can do a, a test as long as we have the essential physical tasks of the job outlined. We can do a, a test that gives an employer a better idea if somebody's physically capable of doing a job. So that's another really cool thing that we'll do. We'll talk a little bit about. 
you know, just in general, case management is a very broad term, and I'm not saying we're going out and going to doctor's appointments with employees after they get hurt, but what we are doing is we're just assisting. We're taking that functional job description, we're getting it to who, who it might be appropriate to, we're talking to the supervisor, the employee, um, of, and the provider that might be giving them care and how they might best and more safely return to what they're doing. So there's a little bit of case management in there. Um, and then certainly health and wellness always comes into play. We are, we're the healthcare resource. You know, these, some of these folks that are working in these settings, you know, some of them never been to the doctor or don't go to the doctor. So we are, when you think about it, they're kind of healthcare resource. And it's, it's actually a very uh, beneficial program for employees to have healthcare that they've never had, the best healthcare that they've ever had by having an athletic trainer that can counsel them on so many things, not only their ergonomics of their job and injury prevention for musculoskeletal, but hey, what should I eat for breakfast? You know, um, hey Joe, I, I notice you, uh, you, you like to drink those monster drinks uh, every morning. Uh, might be a better choice. <laughs> or when it's hot, we talked about heat just recently. You know, five hour energy and uh, you know, a monster during the hot time of the summer in a hot facility is probably not a good idea. So there's a lot of ways that we can help people even beyond the, the, um, the injury prevention musculoskeletal health piece. So really, what are the goals of, of early intervention? I kind of talked about it a little bit already. So it's really uh, preventing the injury, right, from occurring in the first place. So injury, injury prevention meaning stop the progression. So if we're inter interacting with an employee, we want to encourage them to tell us, hey, if you, even if your shoulder's cramping or feels tired, tell me that. That's a clue, that's a hint that something is going on. So we encourage them to report those things that don't feel right and that it's, it's not normal to walk out of here of the plant like this. You know, that's not normal. So we encourage them to change the way they think about their bodies, that it's not normal to have pain when you're doing this. And there can be things potentially that, are, that we can do. So stop the progression is really the goal there. Um, you know, we can help to modify their tasks um, to help avoid um, repetitive stress or injury. Again, we talked about root cause, really important. One of the biggest things we do is just body awareness postural awareness, uh, positioning, so that, you know, um, again, sometimes we can help by changing what they're doing in, in terms of their job. Sometimes we can't, and then it becomes more about posture and, and kind of teaching them what's, you know, what is a trigger. So if you're kind of creeping forward, you know, like we do on our computer screens, um, or if you haven't changed your prescription eyeglasses in a long time and you're doing this, you're actually putting a lot of stress here um, in the job that you're doing. So there's a lot of things that we can identify for folks that they might not think about. Um, you know, it's all about their health overall as a person. So certainly, you know, we work for the employer and they want us there to decrease the amount of injuries that they're having on the work comp side of, of, of it, if you will. But it certainly can be beneficial to have a healthier employee that's gonna be there more frequently or all the time, not absent here and there. And healthier, they're probably less likely to get injured. But even so, even if they get in injured outside of work, we can also help them with that too. So it helps even the company on that front on their group health medical insurance. So there's a lot of ways that we can really impact um, not only the employees and giving them great health care, but also the employers that we work for. So I just, just wanted to, to give you a quick snapshot of, you know, because the data, right, is important these days for anything that you do. And we're always, you, everybody's heard of ROI by this point now, I'm sure, because we talk about that probably in every setting that we, that we do. But this is just a couple of examples. I have a few more I just want to share with you. You know, certainly the employer's looking at this, right, pretty closely. So let's take the people part out of it because there's a, there's a huge benefit there. But... You know, the employers are not going to put us on site unless there's a clear return on their investment, okay? So what you're seeing on the top is, uh, you know, a utility client that we work with. So it's a unique one, which is kind of cool because we don't work in a facility. We work outside with crews in the weather. 
So we talked about heat earlier, but we, we work in the cold and slip trip falls and the ice. But what we've seen is that what we call in our business job coaching, that's that being out present with the employees, talking to them about what they're doing, understanding and trying to coach them on better mechanics, posture, hey, there's a better way to do this. Or um, what we saw uh, with this particular client is when we started, um, you know, very few number of job coaching encounters. And as that number rose, as we were able to interact with the employees more frequently, we saw their amount of what we call recordable injuries go down. Um, same thing, you know, sim similar um, slide in aerospace, um, you know, just one of the things that companies look at is the, no the amount of money they spend on worker co workers' compensation claims um, and the days away. That's very costly for them. So if they can see and show a benefit of that with an early intervention program, certainly that's going to foster, uh, you know, more opportunities uh, for us as athletic trainers. So just a quick snapshot on that. So what are the types of industrial health services that you can provide? Some that we provide, some other companies provide, some that you can provide solely as an, as an independent contractor, if you will. So early intervention, we talked a little bit about. The functional job descriptions, I'm gonna give you just a little bit more background on that. Something called a job site risk analysis, which is a deeper dive into a job task. Um, post offer testing, I mentioned. Um, so there's still some folks that are doing on-site rehab. Um, in some areas. We have uh, one client where we do both. We do early intervention and on-site rehabilitation. Uh, that state is, uh, specifically allows it, and so we are able to do it. But quite frankly, on-site rehab is probably, again, in that reactive phase. It might save the company some money. Usually larger organizations, you know, more than 2,000 people, that they may benefit from that. Otherwise, the number of people that are needing physical therapy, especially with an early intervention program, is probably going to be very few. So, but it is something that can be done. Wellness coaching. I was talking to Jen Doherty just before I started, and it's something she's doing. Um, really, uh, obviously, has grown, and and um, and a lot of athletic trainers are moving into that. So there's a there's a lot of opportunity there as well. And then you know just we get. Um, smaller organizations calling us all the time about, hey, can you come in and do some injury prevention education for our team? Or a health plan. Union, union health plans call uh, on us quite a bit to say, hey, can you come in and talk to our members about healthy posture, healthy work, you know, being safe. Um, I actually did a talk uh, that was not related to um, musculoskeletal health. It was about sleep, nutrition, um, you know, just stress. Um, so they look to us for those things and we can provide those types of things to them. So just to back up a second, I think the way it's important to understand what employers were doing previously and now what a large number of employers are really um, utilizing in terms of us as early intervention or industrial athletic trainers. And what they were doing is they were sending them to places like, you know, initially hospitals and ERs. And, and there are still some employers in rural areas that have no other option. And that's very, very costly. And obviously, it's also all about reactive. So a lot of organizations were using those. It's fewer now. As the advent of occupational clinics have come about, you've seen some of those types of clinics that are kind of chain throughout the country. A lot of them serve employers and they serve them well, especially in rural areas where they're available um, at extended hours for employers when they have an employee that has an injury. And then with the larger organizations, uh, larger companies, they do have on-site occupational health clinics. And we actually do that as well as an organization. We combine a traditional on-site occupational health with nurses, nurse practitioners, x-ray, with early intervention. So we get the right things to the early intervention specialists, the athletic trainers, and we get the correct things to the nurse, nurse practitioners that need elevated care. So it's a really good combination that a lot of employers have seen benefit versus just traditionally having an on-site occupational health clinic. So that's where they were and they're really starting to change in terms of, uh, and this is the reason why they're changing, because there's a common weakness with all of those things. It's all about, it's, it's more reactive than proactive. And again, if you're just talking about musculoskeletal health, yes, do you have burns and lacerations still from different job activities? Absolutely. 
what, where we can serve in that way because of our skill set and background. Again, the majority of injuries for employers are in musculoskeletal. It's, it's usually over 50% of sprains and strains. That's our wheelhouse. So without having any focus on injury prevention or, in, or early intervention, not addressing root cause, you know, they go to the clinic, you know, it's all about treating them, make them feel better, give them a pill, whatever it might be, and that's fine. Um, but nobody's talking about, well, why, how did this happen? You know, why did you get hurt? Let's think about it. The doctor's not doing that. Um, the doctor's not necessarily thinking at that point in time, well, how am I going to get this person back? You know, I wonder, wonder what they do. What, you know, what are the requirements of the job? So that's the difference in terms of what early intervention can provide versus some of the traditional um, care that's been given to them. So again, you know, not rocket science, they need help, and we can become their partner, and we are. Some of the things that um, I think are important to understand, if it's something that you're interested in doing, and I think, you know, athletic trainers, I think, for the most part, have been a lot, you know, very entrepreneurial. Um, I met and learned a lot of things from folks uh, throughout the NATA when I was on several committees. And I know a lot of those folks have their own business now doing some things similar to this. But just to, you know, if it's something to think of, I think some tips on maybe what you might be able to do for a local employer. Um, is you know trying to fit into the environment so we're in a different field right it's not about sports it's about production and what they we produce widgets and how do i keep my people healthy and a lot of actually our success um and our you know really proliferation into industry is because safety professionals that's a, a growing profession over the last 20 years, it has made a huge impact, but they automatically see, hey, this is my partner. This is somebody that can really help me reduce injuries. So they've really bought into what we do as athletic trainers on site. So with that, you know, if we're gonna go approach an employer or a safety professional, we need to make sure we fit in to the environment. And that's, you know, asking good questions, right? Um, not telling them necessarily what we can do, but asking them, you know, what is, you know, tell me about your, employee demographics, what types of shifts do they work? Are they union employees? Are they temporary employees? Um, you know, what's the average age? Um, you know, who's providing the medical care right now? Is it the, the hospital? All those things you gather information to sort of formulate your pitch, right? That's kind of what you're doing here. You're kind of selling, you know, yourself. Um, and if you can look at their injury experience and you can see that they have, like most employers have, you know, well over half of their injuries due to sprains and strains, you can pretty much make a business case. I mean, it's a projected business case, but you can say, hey, let's agree to, to doing this for six months and see, you know, how we, if we can reduce your injuries. Um, if they give you the data, then you can look at the data together, but um, that's kind of the approach that we take when we're talking to employee, employers. We want to show them also that we're the experts. So there are other things that are unique to the industrial setting that you're never going to see probably in traditional athletic training or, or all these things that, that um, employers are actually benchmarked on. And OSHA, is everybody uh, familiar with, with OSHA? So they actually track, uh, I mentioned the term earlier, recordable injuries, an injury that needs to be recorded and reported to OSHA. And they look at industries um, a very fine, you know, amount. they look at broad industries and then they drill down into that to see which employers are hurting employees, essentially is what it is. So that's the reason that they have to report certain types of injuries. So when you go into an employer, you really want to understand what an employer looks at, which is something called total recordable incident rate. So you could say an employer had 30 recordables uh, last year and this year they only had 25. Well, we also need to know how many hours that were worked to get a rate, because otherwise it's not comparable, right? If they had 1,000 employees last year, and this year they only have 800, well, they, they had 25 injuries versus 30 because they had less employees, so you, you have to compare it with a rate. So that's one thing that the industries use. Um, they also use something called a DART rate. Does 
So those are days away, restricted, transferred. So those tend to be more serious, right? Because they had to be away from their job. So those are all things that employers are looking at. So when you go in to talk to an employer, you need to really bone up on, you know, what these types of term, you know, what the type of terminology, the metrics that they look at. Um, but we know from our data personally, and before I ever got into this, you know, 17 years ago, um, that we could we can absolutely affect the number of sprains and strains that, that people are having uh, by our interactions and, and uh, ability to assess things quickly and, and mitigate it with some really um, easy self-care techniques. So we gotta get to know the employer. It's if it's something you're interested in. We wanna know about what their safety culture is. Um, you know, do they have that safety professional, which most places do at this point in time. Um, we wanna ask for job descriptions. You know, what, what are the types of jobs people do? So when, you, when you're talking to an employer and you're asking these questions, then they know that you understand a lot about what their challenges are most likely. Um, functional job descriptions are really a critical piece and they can be used for many, many things. Um, they, um, as I mentioned earlier, will give providers an understanding if somebody is out with an injury, what do they need to do to get back to their job? It can be utilized um, in a court of law. If somebody's injured so severely that they're not able to return, um, they need to sort of be able to understand what their physical demand level is, and that's what the, the DOT is, Dictionary of Occupational Titles. So when you do a, a functional job description, you need to use those same descriptors, So because that actually can be used in a court of law. Is it a low physically demanding job? Is it a medium, heavy? And there's different criteria for that. So this is something that um, there's companies out there that just do what we call consulting. And they, they just do functional job descriptions and job site risk analyses for companies, project-based work. They're not doing early intervention. They're doing a lot of this work um, for organizations to keep them on top of not only keeping their job descriptions up to date, but also trying to mitigate risk. So I won't really look um, too deeply into this because I, I just wanted to include, and, and I think I shared the presentation so you guys will be able to see it, but there's a lot of things to look at when you're um, creating a functional job description. Uh, postures, movements, weights, um, the work environment, hot, cold, inside, outside. Uh, but really what it, oh, this is the slide that gets a little stuck. That's kinda an example. This is ours first page, it's four pages. Very descriptive. Okay, so that's something that we as athletic trainers are doing out in industry, which is cool. Um, some other opportunities, I mentioned the job site risk analysis. Um, you know, we're really looking for high risk. A lot of times the employers know, hey, we got all, you know, they come to us saying, we got, we're having a lot of injuries with this, you know, person in the juicing department. And so we went out to this, uh, this place is in Michigan, I believe, um, in orange juice. So these fro frozen bags of the orange pulp comes in, um, to the factory and so there's a couple things that are, you, you might you may notice this or you may not but they're having a ton of hand and wrist injuries and so you know as athletic trainers we're thinking about right we selection and fitting of equipment so when you look at that what do you see that could be a problem um, and so they're wearing gloves because it's cold they got to wear those rubber gloves and they're using a knife, albeit a very a knife with a very small handle. So the combination of having thick rubber gloves and a small handle does what, right? So we understand this as athletic trainers. It's easily transferable when you're looking at job site um, like this and different job tasks that that companies are having injuries. So you know, is there a better tool for the job? So they got to wear those gloves. We can't change that, right? There are some things in industry we can't change. Um, in terms of jobs, but we can give them a different tool where they can still wear the gloves, they can put their glove through the handle, and then it's much less grip needed and manipulation, you know, flexion, extension, radial, or ulnar deviation. So those are just examples. These are just some pictures of, you know, what we see out there, side bending and rotation might not look significant to us as athletic trainers, but think about somebody that does it eight to 10 to 12 hours a day, okay? They're gonna have some trouble even if it's only, you know, five pounds that they're lifting. You know, we work in a, in a lot of food processing plants. One of them is out in California. They process almonds. And um, 
you know, there's, there's nothing really heavy about those jobs, but this, all this, going through sorting almonds, looking for bad almonds, I mean, you know, the hand, the high hand repetitive nature of it, uh, they had you know, a lot of injuries. Um, so these are just some ideas and solutions of things that we do instead of having that box flat on a, on a flat table, when you provide a table that has a lift like that, then they don't have to reach in and over. It's like right in front of them. So there's just little things. And, and a lot of industries have caught on to a lot of these things that are out there. You know, here's an example of just, this is just one that you, you can see by the type of machinery, we, there's, we can't change that. So then it becomes, we're gonna have to work with the employee on the human factors. And can we, can we provide a platform? So that, you know, there's, that brings other things into play. We always have to worry about unintended consequences, but it makes you think, can we bring a platform up so that now, yeah, they have to walk up two steps, but at least they're not going above shoulder height, which we know is risky for shoulder injuries if they're doing it all day, right? So that's uh, just kind of a couple examples about job site risk analysis. Post offer testing, this is a little bit more complex in that there's a lot of rules, but basically employers have a right to screen applicants. Post offer is different than pre-employment and there's different rules about those, but post offer means basically I offer you the job uh, contingent upon you passing this physical demands um, capabilities test. And that's why the offer has to be given first in a contingent. If you do a pre-employment, then there's, you can't do as much as you can with a post offer test. So just, um, you know, really the, the functional job description is critical. You have to have that to create that post offer test. Um, and just, um, you know, really um, important for the employers and, and service providers like us to follow these things that are applicable. So when we talk about the post offer test, we have to make sure we don't discriminate against anybody. So when we do a post offer test, we actually have to validate it with a, with a random sample of current employees. So we can't have, you know, 10, 20 year olds that are, you know, strong, do this test and we come up with a pass fail, like a circuit based test. We have to diverse, we have an older, younger, men, women, short, tall, and that's how you make sure that you're not discriminated against anybody. And then you come up with um, that test based on the job tasks um, and that functional job description. And sometimes we do circuit based tests, which take their heart rate, but you can do medical components when you do a post offer test. If you do a pre employment screening, those are usually lift tests. Hey, can you lift 50 pounds off the floor? Okay, we can hire you. You're not going to get as much uh, out of that in terms of a pass fail. Um, I just want to show you quickly here what we see here. How are we doing on time, Andrew? Are we all right? Okay. Um, so these are just some of the rules, as I mentioned, but the key take home with this is post offer test is really more robust. It's going to get employers, you're going to get more people that fail that versus just a pre-employment lift test. Um, and so this is kind of what we've seen, and we've been doing this for, you know, almost going to be 30 years post offer testing, you see somewhere in a well-designed test about 15 to 20, 25% failure rate versus um, a pre-employment screening, which is pretty 3% easy. Most people just pass those. And you can't ask any medical questions and you can't take their heart rate or their blood pressure. So you can't identify other things that might crop up. So it is, we always recommend that employers do post offer testing, but it's another thing that again, there's organizations out there uh, with athletic trainers, that that's all they do. They do post-offer testing, functional job description development, post-offer testing for, for employers. This is just a case study. It just shows, again, we always talk and have to talk about return on investment. Why would an employer pay you $26,000 if they're not going to get something for that uh, to do these tests? And so the results of that, you know, the 14 that were not capable, this is an estimation. They weren't capable for various reasons, whether it be orthopedic reasons or, you know, general health reasons. That's just a very conservative cost per case that an employer might have absorbed if they would have brought that person on. And then anybody that has pre-existing that they physically can't do the job, you, they're disqualified because they didn't pass the test. So. And then general medical, we never know. So there's, you know, just an estimation, but there's certainly a cost benefit for the employer to do this.
because of all the things about hiring somebody and turnover and zero to 90 day injuries, if you have a lot of those, um, you're going to have a real problem with your business keeping production going and certainly keeping the cost down. So just a, another idea. A little bit more just to dive into the early intervention because that's really the meat and potatoes of what athletic trainers can do and are doing right now on site every day. Embedded professionals, 40 hours a week. There are some sites that we have, uh, a, you know, most of these companies work 24-7, right? We have somebody on every single shift, first, second, and third shift. A um, little harder to find those folks that want to work nighttime, but, um, you know, for the most part, first shift uh, is pretty attractive to a lot of athletic trainers who have been working, like a lot of you, 60, 70, and 80 hours a week, evenings, weekends. We get a lot of athletic trainers that want that balance. They're starting a family or have a family, and um, so th there is that um, piece of it that's attractive. But, you know, really being embedded in the workforce is the key. We're out on the floor on a regular basis, first understanding what the rigors of the job is and talking to people. And when you talk to the employees, they just, that in itself starts to gain, you get gain some trust and rapport so that they do come to you when they have an issue. But if you go up to, you know, this employee and say, hey, explain to me what you're doing, why you have to do it this way, could you do it this way? They really appreciate that you're taking an active, you know, role in what they're doing and trying to help them. And that's really what it's all about. You know, we educate them on, you know, you name it. We talked about the, I talked about the example of the glasses. We talked about the example with the tool. Hey, my wrist is bugging me. Let me take, take a quick peek at it. And, um, you know, we're, we're obviously first responders because we can be there for emergency. But this is more about minor injuries, minor sprains and strains that we can absolutely cut off at the pass. We can eliminate the root cause. What is the hammer that's making it happen? Not all the time, but a lot of times we can. And if they need any sort of treatment, we use, um, you know, again, more, we're not able to do what we do from a rehab perspective. We're not uh, there setting up a rehab center. But what we are able to do is say, all right, so you got a little inflammation in your wrist. Use ice, you know, a couple times a day. I can get it for you, I'll help you get it when you're on your break. Um, remember your preventative stretching program, if it's appropriate for them, we develop one for every single job. Um, use over-the-counter anti-inflammatories if you can take those. And, um, oh, we can, kinesio tape, we can do some kinesio taping, we can do a soft splint. You know, there's things that we can do. There are other things that we can't do because it makes it a recordable injury. So while we're, we're trying to find that balance, we always want to do what's right. And if this employee has significant swelling, numbness, and tingling, it's, it's probably not, they're probably not going to do well or need further evaluation um, with the, some of those self-care things. They probably need to be referred. So we always want to make sure that that's what we're doing from is taking care of them first and foremost. But if there's an opportunity to manage it conservatively, that's what we do. And so, again, not rocket science. If we catch it early, we're going to be able to mitigate it. This is a really cool... Um, slide here because this is actually straight from the employer's uh, insurance administrator um, and it shows um, the first year is 2015-16 and we started at the end of 2016 with two providers on site and they have three facilities so two providers at one site then we added some in 2017 and 18 at the other sites and you can see a huge difference in not only the cost of the workers compensation claims but the number I mean, they were doing, they were, you know, peaked at 60 claims. And the, the, this is obviously not as recent, but uh, 19, I mean, that's a huge difference. So the employer saw that. And they started to see it early on when we had the two providers at the one big site. They said, we need to get you at this site. We need to get you at that site. And that's how it happens. And again, it's, it's not, it's us going out, being athletic trainers, uh, observing people, creating relationships and trust with people, and then taking care of them when we can. Um, so it's really cool to see that uh, impact. More specifically, this is just more data specific to the site, which looks like the actual cost of the work comp claims and when, when our team started at those different facilities, and it also has the claim number. So again, you know, really, really cool results. Um, and we have five people at three facilities um, and uh, pretty much covering almost every shift, which is, which is pretty cool. 
and we're, you know, it's, it's a unique, you know, when you first start on site somewhere, there's, there's a lot of apprehensive people, employees. They don't trust you, are you part of management, are you a spy? Um, but once we get into what we do as athletic trainers, and it doesn't take long, we have that personality, right? Um, it's amazing the impact that we're having. And again, you know, it's not about just the work-related stuff, you know. We get people, and you know, when we talk to people, it's about, hey, you know, I can help you with this, and you know, let's work as one thing, but you want to be able to lift your kid, you want to be able to throw the ball to your boys, you know, girls, whatever it might be. We make it about them. It is personal because it affects their, their other life, their, you know, their real life, not their work lives. So this is just something about estimation on what, you know, if you worked with a, an employer around the revenue that you can drive from that, it's pretty significant. Um, you know, with consulting, as I mentioned, doing some of those smaller things and then on site early invention, it's, you know, it's embedded professional 40 hours a week. Um, so it, there, there are some sig significant opportunities out there. Uh, but in summary, you know, really what we're trying to do is get people and what we typically see in these, um, in these facilities is that people are sometimes either afraid to report things or afraid to say they're hurt or tell us that they're hurt well too late. I can't raise my arm, I can't do my job. It's too late for us, right? So we really have to push them and the safety team and the safety culture to report what they're feeling early on. Hey, cramping, discomfort, soreness, tell me, please tell me, I can help you. So once we can shift that, um, that makes a huge difference. Um, again, based on our knowledge of anatomy, biomechanics, you know, creating a preventative stretching program that's specific to their job. You know, certainly one size fits all is not bad. We want people to move, and make, you know, move, you know, get the blood flow moving, create some additional range of motion flexibility. But if we can make it specifically to what a person's doing, uh, you know, with those juice bags I was showing you, the orange shoes, I mean, it's gotta be very specific to, to hand and upper extremity, right? I mean, we want them to stretch, certainly, but we gotta, you know, they only are gonna do so many stretches for, so we wanna make it very specific to the job. And then, you know, there's wellness piece of it. You know, we're a healthcare resource for them, so we wanna come alongside them. We wanna come alongside the employee, employer and promote some of the wellness initiatives that they have so we can really be sort of that trusted source for the employees at that site. It's really about partnering with the employers the employee, the supervisor, the safety professional, with the goal of really keeping medical care in-house, because most of it, if it's minor, you can, you can do that. If anything needs to go out, it's appropriate, sir, absolutely, we want to take care of people in the right way. Um, and everything, obviously, has got to be cost-effective, it's got to provide some kind of return on investment. Are we okay on time, we're good? I, I think I'm done, so I'm, I'm interested to take some questions. I want to, I, I, I apologize for the plug, but we are hiring. We have lots of opportunities. Not that you all can't do this on your own. I know you absolutely could, and a lot of people have, but we do have a lot of opportunities out in this part of the country and elsewhere if you want to relocate. So, um, you know, please, you know, if you're interested, do visit. And, but I'd love to have some questions uh, if anybody has any. Thank you, good talk. Um, I'm definitely an advocate for, and I certainly see our place. My question is, what type of resistance or pushback have, has the industry or our industry seen from occupational therapists? Like, isn't this kind of their environment as well in placing employees in that arena? So, um, it's a good question, and I would say I've not seen any pushback from o occupational therapists. And uh, maybe the reason why is at least the clients that we've had where we've come on site and done um, taking care of the on site occupational health clinic, in addition to early intervention, they don't employ occupational therapists. They employ nurses, nurse practitioners. Occupational therapists, in my, where I come from, were hand therapists. But I also know a lot of them work in the functional job descriptions, the post-offer testing, the FCEs and things like that. 
And the beauty about a lot of uh, pretty much everything we're doing here, none of that requires a license. If somebody tells you that it does, oh, you have to be in a, a licensed OT. Mm -mm, wrong. That's the other thing I think it's important to point out. The way we operate, our organization, is while we hire athletic trainers because they're the best person for the job, we're not practicing athletic training. And I know that sounds weird, but if you look across the landscape at what state practice acts are and what we're doing, we're doing first aid as defined by OSHA, which anybody could do. Hourly employees are trained in first aid at these facilities and the safety folks. We're not doing um, you know, rehab and ultrasound and modalities. So we're utilizing our skill set as an athletic trainer, but as a more like a consultant, an early intervention specialist. So that's, uh, and we've never had it it's been challenged, not once, but yeah, that's a great question. And because it, it has actually come up more um, with the nurses, hmm. they're threatened by us, the on site nurses, hmm. because of what we could do. But when, as we've come together with some of those organizations or nurses that have worked on site previous to us getting on, we've developed a really good. Uh, relationship because they understand that musculoskeletal health is not their strong suit, but the other things are, right? The general medical things that, you know, we, and we work together, right? They send the musculoskeletal health to us and vice versa. We send the general medical, but yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Sorry, I have a question as well. Sure. Um, thank you so much for that talk. That was wonderful. And thinking about coming in and being a consultant to a business or a company, mm -hmm. have you ever taken a pathway or has anybody ever thought about or requested to have some type of um, evaluation of common injuries or pathologies and then programming put in place that the organization or business can implement and say, okay, here's 15 minutes out of the work day where we're gonna focus on regaining some strength, some flexibility and so forth so that we can improve performance. Mm -hmm. uh, is that anything that you and your role have? I mean, we do it and maybe in a different way. So the way we approach that when we engage with our clients contractually, then we say part of that contract is you're going to give us your data from at least the last three years so that we can really truly understand where their injuries are coming from, um, you know, what departments, what jobs. And then that's one of the first things that we do on site when we put that person on site is to design that job preventative stretching program and we triage it. Okay, here's the department that has the most injuries. This is what we're going to tackle first. If you were to do that on a consultant basis, I would be the same thing. Hey, well, I can provide you an injury prevention program for your top five injuries if you give me the data. And it, it, it's typically not a difficult thing for them to give you that kind of data. They can de-identify it. They don't, there doesn't have to be any employees' names on there or anything like that. But that's the approach you want to do. You want to show them by, data, by way of data um, what we can do. And then, you know, the other thing that we have to do, our organization and all the others that are doing this, we have to do a better job of publishing. We have a lot of data. So that's one of our goals in the next, uh, you know, two to three years is to start publishing what we have so that other folks can take advantage of that and say, hey, here's the data that shows a preventative stretching program that's specific to the job can decrease musculoskeletal injuries by X percent or X number of dollars. So, yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, what, if anything, are you doing for employees working desk jobs in terms of prevention? Yeah, I didn't talk about that, which is a huge problem. And the funny thing about that is that while we, you know, typically a lot of the facilities that we're at, there's a very small population of office employees, but they're there. And we do do office ergonomics uh, evaluations and help them with their setup. The, the, the strange thing about it is that even though a lot of those folks, you know, have the you know, wrist issue, shoulder, neck, all the things that happen with sitting all day and working on a computer, it's often utilized, they utilize their, their, their uh, group health insurance for it. It's never typically deemed a worker's comp, even though it is a work-related injury, Everybody uses it, so it's always not, not really the focus, but we always offer that service when we're embedded on site. And actually we did, in, in consulting, we do a lot more of that. One year we did um, you know, over 800 uh, people in an insurance company 
we did all of their um, office assessments and um, programming for you know each individual 800 employees it took probably uh, six to nine months to do it but but it is a great uh, another great opportunity that you could absolutely focus you know there's so many call centers now and so many people well, it's different now people are working from home but um, when they do get back, you know, there's an opportunity just to be an office ergono ergonomist specialist um, and really help people out on that front. So it's a good, good question. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. So uh, it's great to, to be here and hopefully uh, I'll come as an attendee in, in next year in Denver. And um, you know, good luck to everybody. And certainly, if you have questions, please uh, please let me know. Or our website has a lot of information. Certainly, um, atipt.com. So, thank you. On behalf of the RMATA, thank you very much today.